Hi, hello, this is Polly Young Eisendrath and Pay Attention, interviews about truth and troubling times. And today I'm here with Charles Eisenstein. I'm very happy to be here with Charles. And Charles is a speaker and an author whose writing and teaching cover a wide range of topics, including the history of human civilization, economic, spirituality, and the ecology movement. According to Eisenstein, global culture is immersed in a destructive story of separation, and one of his main objectives is to present an alternative story of interbeing. Much of his work draws on ideas from Eastern philosophy and spiritual teachings of indigenous peoples. Uh, among Eisenstein's notable works are The Ascent of Humanity, Sacred Economics, and then his recent and I think widely received essays, Coronation and the Myth of Conspiracy, and then the later one, The Banquet of Whiteness. Uh, on my own podcast, Enemies from War to Wisdom, and in my work in Real Dialogue, my latest book, Love Between Equals, and my writing on parenting, uh, I find that my views and ideas sound like and uh, seem to be coordinated well, resonating with Charles Eisenstein's ideas. And so I've been very happy to find his work just in this last year and especially happy to be able to talk to him today. And perhaps this is even one of the benefits of the crisis or the confinement that we're in right now, that I'm able to meet and converse with Charles. So welcome, Charles. Yeah, hi, hi Polly. Uh, yeah, great to, to uh, talk to you again. Yes, and to, and yeah. to really meet, meet you. Um, yeah. So, you know, there, there are many topics that I'm eagerly looking forward to talking with you about, but I want to start with your background because your views and your ideas often sound as though you're a Buddhist practitioner. And of course, I'm a longtime Buddhist practitioner, but I understand you are not. So I wonder how you came to this view that our main human problem is separation from our direct experience from others and from our surroundings. Did that line of thinking come from any particular experience or were there a number of experiences? How did you come to that perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I don't count myself a Buddhist, although having marinated in Taiwan for nine years of my life, I definitely absorbed some Buddhism and a lot of Taoism as well. Um, but, but to answer your question, I held a question in my mind for a long time, uh, which was something like, uh, what's the origin of the wrongness in the world? Mm. As I as I came to understand, you know, even as a teenager or even younger than that, uh, it wasn't well articulated, but like, I knew that it wasn't supposed to be this way. I knew yeah. I wasn't supposed to hate Monday and mm -hmm. to look forward to weekends and the summer and get a little bit of freedom, you know. And then as I learned more about the world, I knew that the rainforests weren't supposed to be getting cut down and species weren't supposed to be going extinct and human beings shouldn't be exploiting and enslaving each other. And that this isn't just the inevitable human condition, but that it could be different. Mm -hmm. And so I became really curious, why is it like this? Mm -hmm. And in my 20s, cycled through various reasons, various offerings, uh, explanations, mm -hmm. why we are in such a state. And none of them were satisfying. Ultimately, I flirted with various of them you know, Marxism, for example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I wasn't satisfied with any. And then the key moment came when I was maybe around 30, 31, 32. I had moved back to the United States then to raise my children and uh, had this idea of suburbia where there's going to be packs of kids roaming around and playing mm. and we went and we bought a house in a neighborhood where there were lots of young families, lots of kids, but no one was ever outside. Mm -hmm. And I, it didn't take me long to figure out why. Mm -hmm. the, the blue glow emanating from every living room, that was part of the explanation. The um, automobile culture where nothing is actually sourced locally, the dissolving of community. And I'm like, this is a kind of separation that, mm -hmm. and where did it begin? It's inseparable from our, from our whole civilization, from the money system that 
requires endless growth uh, from our conception of who we are. So I'm like, oh, this is a kind of separation. And the domination and conquest of nature, that's another kind of separation. And like every problem I looked at, I could frame in terms of the, the story that who we are, are discrete, separate individuals in a world of other, even taking mm -hmm. it back to the mentality of, of technology and science, the idea of progress as an ascent in our ability to exercise control over the control. world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, it's interesting in a way because I, I had as a very young child, the question of what's going on here anyway, because I could see that the people around me were suffering a great deal, but they didn't talk about it. I, I grew up in a working class environment. There was a lot of domestic violence. Uh, I was a very introverted kid who was kind of watching all of that. But I think, you know, in some ways I came to, I came to Buddhism early. I was just like 22 years old. And uh, it seemed to me to be the very first thing I ever met that really seemed to give an experiential answer to my question of what's going on here. Well, partly what I came to, and it's also this story of separation, but that the, the human being, the homo sapien, develops in such a way that it is a necessary development of separating the self, the inside from the outside. And then there's the feeling, I'm in here and the world is out there. And then all civilizations and all cultures have to kind of deal with that gap because it feels as though I am vulnerable. You know, I'm in here by myself. And a lot of people feel like, I'm in here and nobody even knows who I am, you know, because I'm so different or unique or whatever. And the world is out there. And, and uh, you know, over time, I've, I've kind of come at that problem or issue from different perspectives. But, but right now, what, what strikes me in this period of time and has been for quite a while is the polarization of, you know, really the culture that surrounds me. I mean, th things have been, you know, repetitively conflicted, repetitively war-oriented for a long time for North Americans. But the polarization in the sort of general public domain uh, is, is more acute than I ever remember it. And uh, that's kind of led me to feel like... Um, we don't get along as a species, <laughs> you know? It's like, mm -hmm. we can't agree about anything and we won't be able to solve the rainforest, the automobile, the technology that, you know, or the money or anything, unless we can talk to each other, unless we can work with each other. And that alienation from other human beings is right now striking me, you know, that it's very difficult for us to get to group, just to get together and talk about what's going on um and but i got there through the root of developmental psychology i'm a developmental psychologist and buddhism and you got there apparently through the root of just observing your own experience and seeing what it's like to maybe to come back from china to america uh allowed you to see something in a fresh light i, I yeah the I mean, and I could also talk about the impact that psychedelics had on me in my early 20s. Um, and in general, the bankruptcy of the uh, mythology that I had grown up in, which hmm. with its prescriptions of how to live, how to be hmm. a man, how to do this mm -hmm. thing called life. Uh, mm -hmm. It was much harder to believe in it than it was in my parents' generation. Uh huh. Um, yes. When, yes. Yes. Yeah. And and today, even today, like the polarization you're talking about, I think is in large part a symptom of this accelerated breakdown of our systems of meaning and the identity that goes along with them. Yes, and absolutely. It, it's, it's also a symptom of of the erosion of identity that is a consequence of the of the loss of community and the loss mm -hmm. of connection, because really, to to know who you are as more than a narrow, separated individual, you have to be in, in intimate, multidimensional relationships yes. with people yes. and other beings. Yes. And we yes. 
kind of don't have that now. You know, it's just shrunk to the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. but, but if we were living in uh, Stone Age times or in a traditional village or an indigenous tribe or something, like most of the people that you ever saw would know you so thoroughly mm -hmm. that there's no question of pretense. There's no question right. of hiding. There's no question of, you know, this feeling of alienation. Do I, who am I really? And no one else knows who I am really. And no one else sees me. This was not an issue nearly as much. Now there's yeah, still there a process of individuation and right. the, then the dilation of the self that's part of normal human development. But the conditions that we are in stymie that developmental process abrogate the initiations that are supposed to happen mm -hmm. post-adolescence and mm -hmm. keep us trapped in this adolescent, uh, highly individuated state that, that never has a chance to um, crack uh, and, and expand our beingness to include our relationships. And the same thing, you know, true for humanity in general, for civilization in general, stuck in this adolescent state of separation from nature. I could go on with that, but that's the, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's a term that, um, you know, that uh, comes particularly from a, a psychoanalyst uh, that is called mature dependence. And it means that you're dependent in a mature way. And the uh, adolescent earlier aspect is a, a, an anxious independence. And it seems to me that you know, many people are stuck in an anxious independence. The first state is an immature dependence, you know, where you haven't yet actually taken responsibility for your life. But, um, you know, something, things of what you're saying, of course, I, I'm, a, I'm in a slightly different generation from you. Uh, my children are younger than you, but uh, they probably would say the same, some of the same kinds of things you're saying. And, uh, um, I think that there was a breakdown of community that occurred in the period of time uh, from the time I was a child until uh, my midlife, you know, that, uh, and the community breakdown was around this, this general notion of safetyism. Uh, that's what Jonathan Haidt calls it, you know, it's just that people became more and more anxious about their safety. And so there was less and less opportunity for children, for example, to run around together. And of course, in my childhood, you know, I, I didn't, I had to come home when the streetlights came on. I mean, that was, that was the rule. And otherwise, we were out and about. There was a group of us and we had our dogs with us and so on. Um, and of course, even in my own children's childhood, things started changing and there was mm -hmm. anxiety. And now um, I have grandchildren and uh, and now, especially during this 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 confinement, this shutdown, um, my five year old grandchild is not going to go to kindergarten. He's going. He lives in Ottawa, and he's going to stay at home and have some remote kindergarten. I mean, you know, you have to remote kindergarten. But <laughs> the the idea that we are now in, you know, more separation, more anxiety more safetyism than we were six months ago, you know, is, is almost, an, it's almost impossible for me to believe it. I mean, it's like, I thought things had reached their mm -hmm. ultimate uh, of this kind of anxious sort of uh, separation. And now I realize that even, you know, a lot of my friends and peers and fellow Buddhists are all sort of shut down in their, in their homes and they're not, there are plenty of people that aren't seeing their friends, even though uh, here in Vermont where I live, um, you know, there hasn't been a new death from the virus all summer. And um, the numbers are so small that the probability of being with an infected person is less than getting struck by lightning. But most people don't know that, you know, they don't check in on it. They don't yes. look at it. It's as though their, their motivation is so strongly towards something that, you know, this sort of be safe idea that they haven't even looked at what are the parameters that they're operating by that are called safety. You know? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I have a, a comment about that. 
I, I think that you have identified a really deep core issue when you're talking about safety. Um, and the separate self is fundamentally insecure. Yes. Because if you are just the separate self, then, then if you die, then that's the end of the universe, basically. Right. Uh, if you understand yourself and experience yourself as not just a separate individual, then death takes on a very different meaning. Yes. If you understand your purpose here as to contribute something beautiful to the world, then death is not the ultimate catastrophe. Right. In Darwinian biology, uh, you know, if the, the, the old paradigm of evolutionary biology, death is the ultimate catastrophe for your selfish genes. Mm -hmm. In uh, economic teaching, where beings seek, human beings seek to maximize rational self-interest, again, death is the ultimate catastrophe. If you believe yourself as a separate uh, 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 psychology, like a bubble of psychology in a flesh mm -hmm. robot that is, only exists as a psychology because of the flesh robot, then again, death is the ultimate catastrophe. So there's this underlying horror, this, this, this dread mm -hmm. that's built into the separate self. Now, it's not usually um, uh, conscious, explicit, that that's what we're afraid of, but it's underlying everything. So when something comes along, terrorism or COVID, it's almost a relief because now mm -hmm. the inchoate dread has an object to focus on. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems then that if you can only control this uh, threat, then you will live forever. Then everything is okay. So there's a relief in having an identifiable enemy to conquer. Yeah, yeah. And, and putting on the mask seems like a simple idea of control. You know, right. I mean, this, it's, and even though it's, it's a completely irrational thing, I think right. that it, there's a way that it, it, it brings a sense of control that responds to the anxiety. And I, I agree with you. I think the anxiety, though, does reside very specifically with death. And that, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, I'm very much, uh, I wouldn't even say a believer. I'm completely convinced about rebirth. And I've just had enough experiences of the continuity of consciousness with people dying, uh, watching, you know, my late husband had uh, early onset Alzheimer's. And so by the time he died, he had no cortex. But when he was actually in the process of dying, he was conscious. And so it very clearly showed me that consciousness does not depend on the cerebral cortex. And so, you know, the, if, if we could engage with death, from the perspective of it being part of the adventure of life, because life and death are bound together. From the moment you start existing, you start dying, and you're also at risk of dying. And so, you know, you cannot be in life without also being in death. And then the way that our society has organized the fear of dying and the fear of death is that we've separated out people who are dying from the people who are living, at least we try, and so there, there are many individuals, that, people that I see in therapy, who've never seen someone die. They've, and then if they're old and they're looking at their own deaths, it's, it's like going to another planet, you know, that they've never seen it. And so they, they then, I, I think, have fantasies of it being ultimate separation, just going into the darkness, you know. It, it seems very frightening. They project into it uh, a kind of boogeyman, you know, from, from childhood. Uh, well, so, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and also, like the, the, the dominant religion of our time, which is science, right. tells us that. And that if right. you believe in near death experiences, you know, and the continuity of the soul and reincarnation, then you're just being irrational. You're being unscientific. Right. And, and, and you just can't take, you can't take the grim truth of right. total annihilation. Right. Right, right, yeah. right. The, the sort of, you know, there was this, um, th there is this odd thing about death when it comes to science, because there's no science that demonstrates that there's a single birth and a single death. 
there's, there's quite a lot of scientific evidence now for reincarnation. There are a few people that have done a lot of research and also on near-death experiences, the rescue medicine people. There's a lot of research uh, in, um, you know, be, in, in the continuity of consciousness after death from people that have brought, been brought back from a death experience and then from the people that have been doing the research on reincarnation. So there is scientific evidence for reincarnation there's no scientific evidence for a single birth and a single death. And yet people will argue, well, that's not scientific. Because again, I think that we base this idea of science also on some kind of narrative of separation. You know, that the yes. subject and object kind of separation. Well, you know, science, science actually is a, a word that, that brings together a lot of things under one umbrella. Yeah. You know, right. there's the scientific method, there are, right. there's the culture of science, there are scientific institutions, uh, there's, there's even a metaphysical basis of science that's rarely talked about. Right. But assumptions like um, the assumption that everything can be quantified, yeah. that, that if, if it's real, then you can measure it somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, the assumption of causal determinism, that things right. only happen if they're made to happen. This is actually false in quantum mechanics. Right. But, right. but the basic um, mindset of science is analytic. It's reductionistic. It's like, okay, this caused that, that caused that, that caused that. And, and therefore, things can't just happen. And therefore, and, and, and that, that the universe is essentially random. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, these, yeah, these are all deep set metaphysical assumptions that underlie the religion of science. And, and they're, if and you they're accept all pretty those, no. Yeah, I was going to say they're all pretty much based on also the separation of the subject and the object. So once right. the observational issue comes in, like who is, you know, actually writing down that data? I mean, there's, it's just, data don't just occur by themselves. And scientific experiments are always being done by human beings. And so there's always that aspect of human consciousness in it. And of course, uncertainty principle and other things have come into our highest sciences now to change the perspective. And there's, there's plenty out there, as you said, sciences is a very big term. There's plenty right. out there to demonstrate the subject and the object are not separated in the way that, you know, many ordinary people think and perhaps, you know, even even somebody like Descartes, who gets blamed a lot for that, actually had a, a pretty big uh, religious belief behind what he was doing. Um, so yes, it's the religion of science and the drive to control and to predict that seems to me to be part of what makes people so afraid uh, right now, but also afraid of dying. Like you said, if it's if it's just the end, like the end of the movie and then there's nothing. Um, honestly, I, I think that, prost, that probably, uh, even, in its, you know, even in itself, shouldn't be that frightening, but it's that we project, because if there's nothing, there's nothing, why would you be frightened of it? But we project into that nothingness all of the scary experiences of separation, you know, mm -hmm. the, the experiences that we had as children. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I really very much agree with your worldview that this separation issue is at the crux of what is really wrong with, you know, many, let's say, uh, aspects of, um, I'm going to say North American culture because, uh, you know, when you go to Asia, or it's not that there aren't things wrong with other cultures, there are, but not the same things. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, that are wrong for, for people here. And um, I wondered if we could switch gears a little bit because I want to talk to you about gift economy. I want to talk to you about the fact that at this moment, something is changing in relation to money and economies. We don't know where it's going, but um, I mean, there's one sort of hypothesis that we could be forced now into a kind of digital currency because we're being forced to use technology and to really, in my line of work, psychotherapy, I would never have imagined I would be doing therapy on Zoom. I would have thought that to be unethical, 
but now people want that, you know? And so I assume that more and more people are, are sort of accommodating to the idea of digital currency. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about that, but then also your thoughts about the gift economy and how that might, I don't know if you feel that there's a chance that, that things could evolve to support, um, you know, your vision of more sort of sacred economics. Okay, well, those are some big topics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as far as digital currencies goes, what, one thing we have to recognize is that we're already using digital currency. Mm -hmm. Uh, the totalitarian implications of it are, have already happened. Every transaction is visible to the government. And recorded, yeah. And recorded, yeah. Uh, you know, cash transactions are an insignificant part of the economy, even before COVID. Yeah. So, you know, to me, there, the, 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 there are legitimate questions here. Basically, it comes down to um, wealth and and commerce, um, who gets to see what's going on? Right now, mm -hmm. actually, transactions are in pretty much invisible to everybody but the government. Right. And the financial institutions, which are actually an arm of the government in some sense, right. the, the, the power structures, the corporatocracy. Uh, in, in a traditional society, wealth was totally visible. Mm -hmm. It was impossible to hide it in a bank account. Because if you were wealthy, it means you had a lot of land, you had a lot of cattle. Uh, you know, it was it was obvious that you were wealthy, and that means that meant that you couldn't escape the responsibilities and expectations, and the duties of wealth. So, and those were many. You know, if you wanted mm -hmm. to be a a, a a king, you had or, or a chief or a big man, you had to have sumptuous feasts all the time and give gifts and so forth. So you were actually, um, to a large degree, a nexus for the flow of wealth. In a hunter-gatherer society, that was even more true. Mm -hmm. the, the, in Sacred Economics, I, I quote um, some anthropology where the, the anthropologist is quizzing uh, Asan, uh, Kalahari San, about their concept of wealth. And he says, well, you have a word for wealth, uh, for precious objects, kai. Kai means like shiny things and, and you know, rare things. And a kai ha is, we translate that as a wealthy man. So a kai ha, is that somebody who has a lot of kai in his hut? Mm -hmm. And the informant says, no, having a lot of kai does not make you a kai ha. We call somebody a kai ha when he makes a lot of kai flow. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of like a master of kai. He's the guy who hooks people up mm -hmm. with and 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 is is like the rainmaker kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and th that person would have many of the attributes of our current archetype of the rich man, um, mm -hmm. like social respect, influence, um, and a certain kind of affluence. Like mm -hmm. people are gonna give to him, and he's gonna. Mm -hmm. But he has a responsibility then to find a, a channel to give it out again. So when I talk about sacred economics, um, the, one of the questions is how do we create that in a mass economy with mm -hmm. a high degree of division of labor where things are not so visible in a small community, uh, but we have a global coordination of labor that's necessary to, to produce technology and to, um, you know, whether or not you think that's desirable, that, that's where mm -hmm. we are right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, 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 I don't think I, I, right now I want to go too much into the details of like what policies and monetary designs would mm -hmm. bring that element of gift culture to mm -hmm. money, but that's the motivating spirit. Yes. And even what you've said so far, you know, um, I think when, when I was growing up, I, uh, I thought, and I was quite an innocent child growing up in Akron, Ohio. And so, and I hadn't traveled and, but I, I assumed that wealthy people had a lot of responsibility, that they had this kind of responsibility to give back. And I must have heard, I don't know if it was, you know, one of the Rockefellers or somebody give a speech at some point that gave me that idea. And I thought of royalty that way. I thought that these people are not just sort of free 
to sort of run around and enjoy their privilege <laughs> or to, you know, just uh, sort of grow in their power, but that they were actually in a position of, of grave responsibility, that they had to think often and always about how much they'd been given, so how much they had to give back. And uh, that, that whole idea seems to have been, you know, something that um, disappeared really in my young adult years. I mean, I, I don't see, you know, wealthy people uh, thinking in those terms anymore. And uh, uh, so whatever that sort of, that's a probably, like you said, a kind of an archetype of a certain kind of king, some kind of noble being that, that is elevated in this way in order to provide back what has been given. And um, I don't think that we, you know, see wealth being used that way anymore. I, I just, I can't tell, um, you know, if we're moving towards an economy where there's universal basic income, uh, I'm not sure that I think that's a really good thing for human development, but uh, I, I don't know how it's hard to say it's as though the importance of the consumer sort of evaporated too recently you know i think people thought they counted because they were keeping the the, the retail stores going or the the restaurants going or whatever and all of these places are closing and it seems as though we don't even count as consumers now you know so it's not just that the the wealthy don't count, but the consumer in some ways, I feel like um, there's a, a way in which this, this, this recent shift has also shifted away from a consumer culture, but in a weird way, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I'm not buying much stuff <laughs> at all because <laughs> I'm not going anywhere and I'm not traveling. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's something going on that uh, it isn't exactly ideal. You know, I don't feel relaxed about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, yeah. A lot of things are happening at once. A lot of things are happening. And I don't know, do you see a promise in any of this? I want to go on to talk to you about coronation, but do you see any, do you see a promise in what's happening you know, with the world economy or with the sort of technological takeover of things, do you, do you see something that might look promising in terms of spiritual development out there or psychological promise? Um. Um, yeah, um, there's, I, th I think, um, well, one promising thing is that a lot of people are growing their own food now. Uh -huh. uh, people who, you know, have never had a garden before are planting gardens. That's true. And that's probably the most promising thing that I see happening. Uh, I see. The, the, the movement to relocalize our food supply. The problem with the universal basic income, which is... Um, it definitely has some appeal, and I, and I think overall it's a good idea. But the, the problem, of course, is that uh, it generates, if, if, it, if it corresponds to the mass destruction of small business right. and employment, then you become dependent on the state for your monthly right. pittance, which is then right. uh, conditioned on your good behavior. That's right. So, That's right. That's what I would worry about. And I would worry about also the destruction. of. So I live... You know, I live in central Vermont, and um, there are a lot of gardens here. A lot of people do grow their food, and there are a lot of local farms. There's, there's an economy that is pretty local, and I, I see how it's been wiped out already as far, you know, we're, we're not very far into this shutdown, and there are so many places that are closed. There are so many places that I really enjoyed going and every day I went to a certain cafe, even though I live out in the country, I'd drive into town so I could see friends there. And, you know, uh, and, and that cafe is open, but just for takeout now. And, yeah. you know, so there are many, so, many things that aren't. Working. So, so this shutdown, I mean, and the whole uh, coronavirus 
uh, phenomenon. One thing, this is what I, what I wrote about a bit in the coronation, is that it's, it's places that are crossroads where so much has been shut down, so much has been taken away from us, uh, that it gives us the opportunity to ask, for one thing, to, to value the things that have been lost because we've lost them. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, when a loved one passes, you realize how valuable they were. Right. When you're sick, you realize how valuable health is. Right. If you can't breathe, if, if the air is full of smoke, you know, you, you value fresh air again. When the cafes all close down, when you can't gather with people, uh, then you understand how valuable that was, how precious it was, even to see other human faces in public right. um, that aren't masked, okay? So, so maybe, so we're being asked, okay, what that we do not have anymore, do we actually really want to reclaim? And what can we let go of? Mm -hmm. you no, know, like for me, jetting around the country or around the world, speaking at conferences, I can, I can let go of that. Uh -huh. you know? I mean, you know, online conferences don't have that element of the random encounter between sessions in the hallway and the mm -hmm. cafeteria, like that, that kind of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a, a place for, I call them synchronicity generators. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as festivals go, oh my God, I mean, this is one of the things, do we want to have a future where we've decided that it's just too dangerous ever to gather for a music festival or for a wedding or for a dance party? Right. Like, I mean, this, you know, different people have different views. Some people would say, yeah, um, we need to be safer. Even if COVID disappears, mm -hmm. we, you get the flu, you know, mm -hmm. even the common colds, you know, kill some people, especially old people, and it can spread to them. And like, you can have reasons that are not even dependent on COVID-19 to maintain lockdown forever. But it, it, and I, I, but what I'm saying is that we are being asked a question we've never been asked before, because up until now, we've taken for granted the direction of society toward more and more control, more and more safety, um, more and more separation. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we're, we're being shown like a preview of the destination yeah. to, to which we've been headed. And yes. we're being asked, do we really want that? And what are we willing to sacrifice? Uh, if we do not want that, are we willing to be maybe a little bit less healthy? Although that also, uh, I mean, ultimately, we're not going to be more healthy by no, cutting ourselves all. off from each other. No, I mean, immunity actually depends on interaction with our species. <laughs> you know? right. And so the idea of isolation was never really the idea connected to, to health. So, you know, I think you're right about you know, the questions you ask. I, I'm just going to read a little passage from the coronavirus that I had written out that, uh, do we want to wear masks in public all the time? Do we want to be medically examined every time we travel, if that will save some numbers of lives a year? Are we willing to accept the medicalization of life in general, handing over final sovereignty over our bodies to medical authorities as selected by political ones, do we want every event to be a virtual event? How much do we want to live in fear? It's not hard to imagine, especially if social distancing is successful, that COVID-19 persists beyond the 18 months we're told to expect it to run its course. It's not hard to imagine that new viruses emerge during that time. It's not hard to imagine that emergency measures will become normal, just as the state of emergency or declared after 9-11 is still in effect today. And it's not hard to imagine that reinfection is possible so that the disease will never run its course. That means that the temporary changes in our way of life might become permanent. Well, we're six months into it. You wrote that in April, and, or maybe even March, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, March. Yeah, and we're six months into this now, and it looks like these changes are not going away. Uh, you know, it, here in Vermont, we were told two months to flatten the curve. The curve has been flat for a while now, quite a while. And there's no change in, you know, what we're allowed or not allowed to do. There's a little bit of relaxing on the number of people that can, can gather inside, but they have to wear masks. So um, 
you know, when you say we're being asked these questions about what we consider valuable, uh, I mean, I have absolutely no question about what I consider valuable. I, I believe that contact with my species and being able to get together with my friends and having my, my grandchildren be able to go to school and be with their friends and so on, I, I think that's beyond precious. I mean, I think it's always been the stuff of what it means to be you know, a social being, which is- what But Polly, people are gonna die if you do that. You care more about your personal freedom and children going to kindergarten than people dying? I mean, well, that's, you know, that's what we have, that's the argument I know, that we I know. have and to- People yeah. die from yeah. downhill skiing and ice climbing and people die from driving their cars. And, you know, I mean, it's no, before this particular moment, I've never heard anybody say, I'm not gonna do backcountry skiing because a lot of people die in the backcountry skiing. You know, it just wasn't even in part of the reasoning. In other words, risk taking and engagement with life right. was but what, many, many what people, people would say here. is that you're it's not your risk, it's you're you're putting other people at risk by not yes, abiding so, by the rules. Yes, that's the yeah. That's and so I, I want to get into more of a conversation about that because you know I see so many of these placards that say we believe in science. You know they say things like we believe in love, we believe in science, Black Lives yeah. Matter, and all this. Um, I always wonder the we believe in science thing always gets me, but um, the uh, the fact is, will we be able to choose to be able to congregate? and to be our natural social selves. Will that be a choice that we can make or has that choice been taken away already? Well, I mean, when I say it's a choice, I'm, like I'm not saying it's gonna automatically be granted to us if we decide that we want it. We, we have to actually claim it through a political process. Mm. And as far as you know, this whole thing about, um, you know, you're gonna put other people at risk and so forth, really what comes up is um, conflicting values within society. Nobody, nobody would want to shut down all of society if it would save one person. That's right. Right. But probably even you would agree to quarantine and lockdown if we had the Black Death killing 60% of the pop population. Sure. They, right? even, even Ebola. Even if it wasn't killing 60%, if Ebola were around because of the way it acts and how quickly it acts and how destructive it is, yes, it would be yeah. valuable. Okay, so those are two yes. extremes, two yes. poles. Yes. We're somewhere in the middle. Yes. Uh, so basically, to me, it's really, it comes down to our original topic. Uh, why do we value risk minimization so highly uh, among the, the, the multitude of values that that every human being holds. Why has this one become paramount? And I think it comes down to the separate self, the program of control, the fear of death, uh, the, the idea that, that underlies technological utopianism, that we make the world a better and better place by exerting right. more and more precise control right. over the microbial world, over the material world, and that someday we'll be able to even manage our body chemistry, our brain chemistry. You'll never yeah. have to be sad. You'll never have to suffer. We're going to engineer all suffering out of existence through precise control of all beings. Like, and as long as you, and that's an extreme version of what in the essay I call the civilizational tilt toward control. Anyone immersed in that, if they're in government, if they're Bill mm -hmm. Gates, they mm -hmm. don't have to be a nefarious villain no. No. To, to celebrate the next advance in right. our ability to control the world, whether it's right. through surveillance, whether it's through you know, implanted microchips or, or whatever, because control is how good things happen. It's what raised us from being wild animals at the constant mercy of nature, barely struggling to survive, to the safe, comfortable lives that we have today. Mm. And so this whole narrative yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, depends actually on ignoring a lot of important information. Like, yes. Was hunter-gatherer life actually this tooth and nail, desperate struggle right. to survive and miserable? Right. Well, no, in fact, no, it, wasn't. it wasn't. In fact, no. every, every building block of this narrative has cracks in it.
But right. that's the story that people are immersed in. And it's not only a story, it also corresponds to an economic situation, a social situation, like, um, and, and a psychological situation. Uh, it corresponds to the response to trauma that, mm -hmm. that people, that is rife in our society, uh, both you know, full-blown trauma that we recognize, but also the muted trauma of, for example, um, having ties develop with your daycare provider as mm -hmm. you're, you're two years old, you know, and you attach to this person and then you move to another center the next year and that teacher gets mm -hmm. fired and you make a new tie and then that gets broken. And then you have your teacher and then that gets broken. And then your family moves and that gets, you know, that tie gets broken. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't recognize how, how wounded we are. And, and so that breaking of ties, that repeated breaking of ties and the, the failure of ties to even be developed in the first place to, to like to be alienated from the outdoors. Right, right. Like that, yeah. that is the experiential correlate to the story of separation that mm -hmm. tilts our civilization toward more and more control. And if that doesn't change, then whether it's through the war on terror or the war on COVID-19 or the war on this or the war on that, we're always going to be acting from that fundamental insecurity. Well, you know, that the, the, the point that you're making, it has a lot of levels in it, obviously. I, I find that control, the idea of control and the desire to be in control is the major thing that I treat in psychotherapy. It, it, it covers everything from eating disorders and, you know, anxieties about your health to relational problems, trying to control your partner to issues that people have about their identities, wanting to control how other people perceive them and talk to them and so on. And that idea of control has, has, is a fairly new, a fairly new development in um, my world of psychotherapy. I'd say it's about 15 years old. It wasn't really around. Something changed and um, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about what you think changed, but I want to add one other piece to this first, that um, a few years ago, I'd say it's maybe now four or five years ago, I was on a panel at the Helix Foundation in New York, and it was on immortality. Now, I got invited to that panel by accident, one of those synchronous things that you were talking about. I was at a, a dinner party in New York. There were people talking about this panel. And somebody said, you know, we really need somebody like a Buddhist or something who doesn't really believe that, you know, immortality is a good idea. And I said, hey, I, you know, I love mortality. I mean, I'm into mortality. I like the fact that we have a limited lifespan and I like the whole thing. And they, were, well, they said, well, would you like to come and be our Buddhist speaker uh, on this panel? The panel freaked me out. I honestly didn't know about transhumanism. I didn't know what was happening in the world of cryogenics, of, uh, I mean, I don't even want to go into all the detail of it, but there were a lot of people, I would say roughly your age. In fact, a lot of people, I mean, on the panel, there were, I think, eight of us, and, and the rest of them were men. I was the only woman. I was the oldest person. And I was the only person who didn't believe that immortality would be a, a really wonderful thing if human beings could achieve it. Everybody else, and, and some of them, there was a physicist, you know, there was a kind of cultural commentator. I don't remember the people's names anymore. But I was really shocked by this narrative. And then I began to look into it. And then I began to, to see how widespread it is and how the technology is really developing. That, you know, the idea of extending, they were saying at least to expend, extend the lifespan to 150 years. But then they hope to, to sort of bootstrap that further so that there might be the possibility for immortality. And, and pretty much every one of the speakers started out by saying, I would love to live forever. You know, I, I sort of, I, I love myself, I love my life, and I would like to live forever. And I, I started out by saying, it would be ridiculous to me to think I'd be Polly Young Eisendrath forever. I mean, I am looking to get out of that fairly soon. It's been nice, 
but you know, I'm, I'm very happy with this framework that we have of, of nature and cycles and time as we understand it, which is that there's a kind of renewal through a cycle. And, um, but it was, it was really surprising to me. And then I began to see what was actually happening in the transhumanism movement. And uh, I, I think it goes beyond control. You know, I think it is the desire for immortality and that's always been around. I mean, since ancient cultures, Gilgamesh is about the desire for immortality. But I do think right now, it's got a handle connected to fear and control. Yes, well, the, the desire for immortality, that's the ultimate expression of conquest and domination. It's to conquer death itself. Yeah. They're gonna have a really unpleasant surprise coming from them, <laughs> for them, yeah. uh, to the extent that they succeed. Because what they're, so, I don't one think thing, they'll succeed, but anyway, go ahead. Right, for one thing, the generosity of the universe is such that we are, we are, our, our bodies are, um, are designed or have evolved to give us the lifespan that is necessary to live a complete human life mm -hmm. at this stage of human development. So you have your adolescence, you have your first love, you know, you have mm -hmm. your ambitious twenties, you have your family, you have your period of stability, you have grandkids, you know, you have all the different initiations of a lifespan ending with your great grandchild on your knee. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of, as long as you need to live. That's the ultimate, yeah. A dog doesn't need to live mm -hmm. that long to have a full right. experience of dog. And that's why their yeah. lifespan's 12 years. Right. Uh, a rabbit, you know, to be, to do everything a rat, right? So, so until our society and, and our species changes to a point where a full human lifespan requires more years, none of these technologies are really going to work. I, to the I extent also, that they do yeah. work, but that, that's the good scenario. The bad scenario right. is they do work and you end up imprisoned in the hell of a self that's become too small for you. That's exactly what I think is more the more likely outcome because even as I look at the technologies and I look at AI and I look at the robotics and so on, I don't have the same impression that a lot of people have about uh, what could be developed. I'm much more on the side of say somebody like a Donald Hoffman than I am on the side of somebody I can't, you know, like a, a Bill Gates or, or the transhumanism people or whatever. I actually think that robots are not conscious. And I think AI will never be conscious. And I think it won't be conscious because consciousness can, is, is not predetermined. It is not a deterministic system. It's like life, it's an open-ended system. Whereas I think anything that is robotic cannot move to the point of non-determinism. So I don't feel like there's a great chance of this generation of Silicon Valley guys making immortality a main thing. But I think that the movement towards exerting that kind of control is possible and that people do fall for the fear for the reason you're saying they're afraid of death. You know, they're afraid of actually uh, their own, let's say, limitedness. And it's because somehow as a culture, uh, and I don't think this is worldwide, but I, I think that we've, we've developed a kind of ideal about control, about purity, about staying safe that wasn't around when I was growing up or even when I was a young adult. And I, I, I feel like that has something to do with overparenting. <laughs> I think you feel it may have something to do with something much bigger, but you know, what, I, what I've seen in my own life is uh, feminism you know, I'm a feminist. I was in the 70s kind of feminism, uh, really interested in women opening up their lives and being able to uh, succeed at using their intelligence. And I figured they could figure out the child rearing thing along the way, you know, that we can work it out with our partners or whatever. But what happened instead was that as 
many of the people that I see in therapy got better and better educated and more and more capable, the women, they decided, oh, I want to put this into being a mother. And so then they took all of this intelligence and all of this PhD study and they stopped working or they worked part time and they focused on this one or two children thing. And then they were controlling everything, you know, and here in, in Vermont, it, it looked like this. I have to sew my kids Halloween costume. Everything has to be organic. My child needs to be accompanied door to door on trick or treat. And I will be there every step of the way. And I will be the witness to what my child does. And so it became a kind of, I think like a very intelligent, obsessional kind of mothering. And I do think that has led to some of this hyper control stuff and that the over parenting around the idea of not just keeping my child safe, but making my child a genius, you know, making my child the first one to do A, B, or C. Um, I, I think that has contributed a lot to this desire for control and the fear of uh, danger and, and also perhaps even, um, you know, the, the idea that we could uh, somehow control the body enough to make it immortal. But I, I think you have a different idea about what brought about our current sort of obsession with safety. Well, I think what you're describing is part of the picture. Uh, and I think what you're describing is just as much a symptom as a cause of the trend toward control that we see. It, it, actually, I think it goes back many thousands of years and has, intensi has intensified with the evolution of technology and the evolution, the co-evolution of society with technology. Um, and on a deep level, it's again baked into the scientific cake that, and this is actually much bigger than science, but the location of intelligence in the human being alone, the uh -huh. location of beingness in the human yeah. being alone, Right. means that, that and, and to believe that the world does not possess its own um, being, yes. its own sentience, its own consciousness, its own, you said, you know, AI or robots are, are, are not conscious. I'm like, well, maybe everything's conscious. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm anyway, not, that, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, know, I know what you're saying, and I, I wouldn't confine consciousness to human beings by any means. But uh, I, I was just, I was excluding so, machines, yeah. Right, so, okay, so, so if we take that for granted, then progress means imposing intelligence onto a world that has none, bringing consciousness onto a dead automaton. Uh -huh. and, and it means also that our, because, right, because the world outside of ourselves, it's, it's these random forces, it's these competing mm -hmm. other beings, so they don't care about us. The sun mm -hmm. uh, is only shining on the earth and nourishing life because of a series of incredibly lucky coincidences. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that the sun, we don't understand in our culture that the sun wants to mm -hmm. nourish life on earth, that it wants to give these gifts. That's not a scientifically formulable concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that, so, so that would be called anthropomorphic projection for a mm -hmm. scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, so the same thing then, when we understand that we are part of a much larger intelligence, mm -hmm. then what becomes important is our participation in that intelligence. Because mm -hmm. we know that we are here for a purpose, not just to survive and reproduce. So even accepting that immersion and entanglement in a larger purpose and intelligence and consciousness reduces the fear of death. Yeah. And we no longer yeah. want to, because if, if there isn't any of that, then what meaning is there in life? There isn't any. So you might as well just look out for yourself, look out for your children, maximize your chance of survival, minimize your risk, maximize your safety and your comfort. But if you are, and this is, this is, this is how people behave when they're not aligned with a purpose. But yeah. if you have, 
a cause or an aim in life that they care about, they'll sacrifice their lives for that cause. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So when we're alienated from that on, on like a metaphysical conceptual level, but also um, on a personal level, then we enact it in our parenting and it becomes mm -hmm. more important for the kids to survive. Like that becomes so overridingly important that we don't value the, um, say the development of capacities that will enable them to contribute to the unfolding of life and beauty in the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, because there, and it, but on some level we know that there are more important things in life than surviving it. And in fact, you can't survive it. Only if you think, believe in immortality and, and, and have, uh, live in denial of death, can you even imagine or, or pretend that you can survive life. So I think that, that what you're talking about, like, yes, the overparenting, the protectiveness, I mean, it is incredibly damaging. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I mean, you like just barely touched on how damaging it is. Because right. for example, what, what you're telling a child when you're hovering over them and protecting them from every risk is that you are incapable. You are not trustworthy. The mm -hmm. world is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're actually prevent, and if they never bump their head, they never learn that head bumps hurt. They never learn to be careful. Right. They never learn to master their world if they're being protected all the time. So it is, I mean, this is one of the most disturbing things for me about our society is that, that like the freedom to be a child, if you give that to your children, CPS comes and takes your children away. It's that bad. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I know parents who's, who have had that happen because their children yeah. were playing in the park across the street. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I've heard Jonathan Hyde talk about it too, in terms of free range kids and so on. And, you know, allowing his kids to be on the subway in New York when they were nine years old by themselves and having to attach a little note to, to them to say to the policeman, you know, the, <laughs> you can call me up and my, my son has my permission to be out here. Uh, I wonder if you think though, uh, I, I think about this a lot, that my generation walked away from the churches, the temples, the religion, the traditional religions, we pretty much shed those if we were, uh, you know, supposedly educated and so on. I mean, there are certainly people in my generation who practice evangelical Christianity, who practice, um, you know, various kinds of um, uh, Judaism as well as Buddhism, of course. But I think in walking away from uh, religions, we walked into something that we were not aware of, you know, that the, these religious communities, churches, synagogues, provided something that was much larger than just a sort of set of rules. They were, in fact, communities. There were traditions. There were stories. And the stories were almost all about the things you were talking about, having a purpose in life, a bigger purpose than just yourself, that you're here to devote yourself to something that's much bigger than you, that the life is not about your identity, and that, that, that there were rules like the Ten Commandments or the Golden Rule that were meant to be followed in a general way. So, you know, sometimes I think that walking away from all of that actually also introduced more anxiety for the individual ego, because now parents had to raise their children without the help of a larger group of people saying, hey, there's a bigger purpose here. There's a and, and what it comes down to, honestly, is, uh, you know, the idea of always asking your kid, what do you want to do now? Or what are you interested in? Or, you know, down to even gender inquiry, what gender do you think you are? I mean, it's way too much anxiety back into the kid who doesn't know, you know, and would have, under other circumstances, be walking into a tradition that said, okay, you're going to get initiated to do this, and now you're going to get initiated to do that. And there would have been a sort of general flow with a community and a support for that. Uh, so I often think about the fact that, um, you know, middle class educated people walked away from structured religion not so long ago, and that that increased a lot of anxiety about purpose in life and also 
about safety and why you should take risks and what you should sacrifice and who you should sacrifice for and so on. Yes. Traditional religions are themselves uh, a mix of separation and interbeing. Yeah. Uh, so what people don't realize is that stepping out of those religions, they've stepped into another religion. Yes, which, right. You know, might be yes. called science, but it also has economic and political dimensions. Right. <laughs> we don't right. recognize it as a religion, but in fact, as I was saying before, it has these metaphysical foundations. Um, you mentioned some of them too, the, you know, objectivity for one. It has right. a priesthood. It has its own sacred texts. It has its martyred saints. It mm -hmm. has its evangel evangelists. Mm -hmm. It has its uh, rituals. Um, it has a system for indoctrinating youth. It has schisms and heretics. Mm -hmm. uh, it has, you know, excommunication. If you deviate from dogma, your funding gets cut off. I mean, it yeah. has the entire apparatus of a religion. It tells yeah. us how the world began. Tells us what the purpose of life is. Tells us what a human being is. It tells us, gives us a path to knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, the royal road to truth. I mean, it is, people don't realize that, that we are still in a religion and that this religion embodies a, um, embodies separation. In fact, one reason it is successful is that it is part of the ascent of separation. Uh, and this is um, part, on a collective level, maybe to take a little bit of positivity from this, maybe we are in fact fulfilling the individuation process on a, on a species level and now entering a uh, coming of age initiation that cracks us open and uh, brings us to the place of mature dependency where we no longer imagine ourselves to be independent of mm -hmm. the rest of life Mm -hmm. but, but know ourselves to be dependent and see ourselves as contributors, full members of the tribe, as it mm -hmm. were. Mm -hmm. Full member of the tribe doesn't just take from the tribe like a child does. That's immature dependency, but it also gives. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and I think we, can, we see signs of this awakening, like in the regenerative agriculture movement, you know, mm -hmm. for example, the ecosystem restoration movement to, to like, yeah, we want to, contribute to the unfolding of life and beauty. That's why every species is here. The history of life on earth is a history of more and more complexity, more and more diversity, more and more complex ecosystems, more and more life. Going back, you know, the multicellular organism, that increased the amount of life. The flowering plant it was only a few tens of millions of years old. Uh, and, and now we're born here as all species were born, to bring yet a new layer of complexity and life here. And, and we haven't done that yet. We've, we've been gestating, we've been immature, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. maybe now as we fulfill the, and, and explore the extremes of separation and feel confined, like there's mm -hmm. no more room, it's not exciting anymore as it was when I was a kid still, like the conquest of space, that lit mm -hmm. my fire and, and, mm -hmm. and every other young person. The, what's the last frontier, the next frontier? No one's excited about that anymore. Right. I mean, how many people are excited about a mission to the moon, a mission to mm -hmm. Mars? Mm -hmm. No one, like we're not, like already the, the, the collective psyche is turning toward, looking, looking toward uh, and, and wanting, yearning for the, to, to enter the mature state of service. And that's why people are, so many people facing the crisis, the archetypal crisis, uh, the apocalypse, mm -hmm. Y2K, mm -hmm. uh, peak oil, climate change, financial collapse. Like there's a certain, um, uh, uh, a certain amount of glee, like well, there's excitement, yeah, of, yeah, yeah, like I kind so of because it, yeah, it seems like an adventure again. I mean, it seems yeah. like there's something 
to be, you know, I, I mean, I think that, um, I, I, I agree with you about science turning into a religion. I don't think it's a necessity for science to turn into a religion, but I do think that it's a necessity for human beings to have a religion. I mean, um, you know, I'm a Jungian analyst. You've read, you've mentioned the term archetype many times in your, in your lingo. I don't use the term so much because I feel like people don't really understand what it means. It's like a primary imprint. It's something that's given in the nature of things. And um, I do think that human beings are, are archetypally or naturally religious. I think that we need something that is bigger than the ego to believe in. And so I, one reason why I think science has moved into that view is because we've walked away from certain traditional religions and that uh, science and religion try to answer the same question. They try to answer the question, you know, what's the truth or what's going on here? And uh, um, I, I do think science does make room for argument and debate and that there is something about science when it's practiced well, the scientific method, that um, is unique about it and makes it really distinctive and makes it clear also that what's going on right now is not science. Uh, and that's falsifiability. You know, in science, if you have a position or a hypothesis, you have to be able to falsify it as well as to demonstrate it or show it. And so much of what's going on in terms of our beliefs about COVID or wearing masks and so on, um, you know, can't be, can't be falsified. For example, I cannot say I am well or I can't say, um, I can't falsify the statement, I may be contagious. Because if I say to somebody, I'm well, they say you could be asymptomatic. That's why you have to wear the mask. But if I say, I haven't been exposed to anybody who is symptomatic in the last two weeks, which is the period of quarantine. So can I say I'm well then? Can I say, I've, let's say I've had a COVID test a day ago. Can I say I'm well today? There's no time in this narrative of COVID that you can say you're well. So it's never falsifiable. There's never a time where you could falsify your contagion. So that's inherently unscientific. So, you know, within the scientific narrative, there is a process of testing and there is a process of debate. I don't think that most people who believe in science have any notion of that or what science is. Instead, I think they're engaging in what you're talking about, which is the desire to predict and control. And that that's, you know, sort of separating ourselves out from a world that we think of as an object. And then we want to predict and control that world or predict and control the resources. Um, but let's say, you know, the idea that we may be breaking open to a new purpose. I, I think it would have to be a purpose that completely transcends the ego, that transcends this sense of self-conscious self-protection. You know, it would have to be something that takes us into, like you said, the new adventure. You know, what is the new adventure that actually brings new meaning to, um, to humanity or to aspects of humanity, that new meaning would have to, uh, it would have to in, in some way, uh, ha I, in my mind, it has to have something to do with, with dropping the fear of death, that, 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 that the new whatever is coming has to be a new engagement with the idea of death in all of the belief systems that were around in traditional cultures and hunter gatherers and all, there was always a transcendent aspect. And I don't think there was ever this, uh, you know, tremendous fear of risk that we have right now. And uh, so, I, I mean, I don't know the way you envision the cracking open or how that would be a maturing um, 
Do you think just in the nature of the crisis that we're in? I, I see two, um, two things coming together in this initiatory time. Um, and it maps quite well onto uh, coming of age initiations in traditional societies. One part is, so maybe the initiate is normally will be, will be taken away from the village, taken away from familiar circumstances and put in a completely new situation where say it's a young man, where he does not know what to do, where none of his um, customary ways of being are sufficient to the task at hand, where he's not in control of things and where his identity and his constructs no longer serve him and they fall apart. Uh, so he could be you know, tied to a tree for four days uh, or seven days with no food and water and maybe you're gonna die or maybe mm -hmm. subjected to extreme fear and pain or maybe you have to, to take a massive dose of a psychedelic plant or something like that. So you're, you're in a, you could look at it as a kind of a crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think that collectively, we are going through this process of sh the shattering of our identity, uh, especially in America, but to some extent throughout the entire civilized world. Mm -hmm. We conceived ourselves to be no longer works and maybe uh, as the, the hammer blows of the, the challenges to our identity intensify, maybe one reaction is to cling all the more tightly to who we thought we were, make mm -hmm. America great again, to cling to an imaginary mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. But at some point, we can't maintain it anymore. And we have, we are then birthed into um, a different self collectively a different story of the people that says why we're here, where we came from, where we're going. That's one aspect. Another aspect of mat maturation is falling in love and mm -hmm. the experience of a different kind of love than the child's love for the mother. Mm -hmm. the child, it, it's, it's, it's an asymmetrical love for the mother. Mm -hmm. we, we, we receive and whatever we give back is kind of token. Uh, you know, you might give your mother a Valentine's Day card or something like that as a little child, but really your job is to receive and to grow. And, mm -hmm. and that's what humanity has done, or civilization has done. We've received and we've grown and grown and grown, and the mother provided all. Mm -hmm. And now we are at the, at, 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 as the individuation becomes complete, and we develop even a concept of nature as distinct from ourselves, which did not exist uh, mm -hmm. in traditional cultures. There, there was no separation that enabled nature to be conceptualized as an other. Mm -hmm. But as we become separate, we're able then to gaze at the beloved and to mm -hmm. fall in love and to enter into a different kind of relationship where it's no longer about just taking, but also about, about giving uh, about, and about co-creation. So, so it's like when you fall in love as a teenager, you know, you, or, or as, as a young adult, if you have gone through this initiation, you don't just want to take from that mm -hmm. person. You know, you want to give a, your gift, a gift to the sweetie. You know, it's, it's such mm -hmm. a natural impulse. Mm -hmm. The first stirrings of romantic love, you want to give flowers, you want to give something. And then as the relationship progresses, you want to create together. You start dreaming together about the future. So this impulse is already awakening within civilization. This, this, this falling in love with the planet that really mm -hmm. took on a new phase when the first photographs of Earth came down right. from space. Right. You know, people fell in love with Earth. Right. So this is, the, this is the pull. We're being pulled toward that maturity, even as we're being pushed out of the womb of our childhood by the converging crises that form a birth crisis in a way. Now I'm mixing metaphors, mm -hmm. coming of age or birth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just to say that, that these are two of the elements 
in birth, it's true too. The, the womb is expelling you. You cannot abide in the world that was familiar. Mm -hmm. And there's also, when the cervix opens, there's also a light that you're moving toward. There's a hint that there's another mm -hmm. world there. Mm -hmm. and, and we're having both in our time. The old world is becoming untenable, but we catch glimpses of our destination. Little, like, you know, maybe you catch a glimpse in, in, in an encounter with holistic medicine that, that, or, or in a, a relationship or, or a community where people are really cooperating and, and you sense a possibility that feels mm -hmm. real. That, that's not just an exception to grim normality, but it's real. Mm -hmm. So I think we're getting both of, the, both of these, the, the push and the pull are converging today. Um, and you think that this kind of transformation, well, uh, a couple of things that I, I would say, I'm sort of observing and hearing you speak, that a lot of, uh, a lot of the views the, of the whole earth and the views of species and the diversity and so on do come from scientific study. You know, I mean, they do come from our ability really to uh, have mastered certain kinds of studies of our environment. I mean, previously, there just weren't those kinds of views. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't okay. I mean, science, yes. yeah. science so, has, uh, it, it is a way to see more yes. deeply. In fact, I think that's actually the higher purpose of science. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, but, you know, got to be careful there because indigenous societies had an incredibly deep and sophisticated understanding of their environment. Right, and, right. But it wasn't, yeah. it probably didn't include the whole earth view, you know, that photograph that a lot of people could see. I mean, it's when you're, when you're, um, you know, there, there are different ways that we experience, you know, obviously our environment. Science has brought about a certain kind of objectivity and a certain way of understanding. And it, it could be that what you're saying is that the aspects of science that have become, you know, more dominant as a religion where people just say, I believe in science and they don't really understand what it is, that those aspects are cracking open. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying science is a religion as a term of critique. I think religion uh -huh. is good. I want to embrace science as a religion. I want to recognize it as a religion and maybe approach it with the attitude of a religious reformer. Like uh -huh. what, just like any other religion. It's only mm -hmm. by taking science's view of religion and applying it to science that it becomes a term of critique. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I, I think so it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful religion and, and, and powerful and, and sacred. And it has a core essence. Like each religion, as it comes onto the scene, brings a new um, unfolding of consciousness mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. a new medicine to the earth. Uh, and the, the core essence, the core spiritual principle of science is humility. Yeah, it is. That's true. That's true. Because it's actually, there's always a new question. You know, the questions cannot be fully answered. Um, but just to, to take a step back to what you were saying previously, that if we're entering into some kind of new paradigm in which there is a, a you know, which we've seen sort of glimpses of a more holistic way of living and perhaps a, a, a more sort of, uh, you know, consciousness driven way of living. Um, what I'm wondering is, do you see, do you think there's, there's a direct path for getting there? Or do you imagine that there's going to be some sort of, you know, breakdown that includes civil war or something like that in this country uh, as a result of the crisis that we're in now. I mean, I can't see an easy transition from the level of fear and the distortion of reality that we're in. You know, it seems to me very analogous to 9-11 and that there were no weapons of mass destruction there wasn't a reason really to invade Iraq. There wasn't a reason for us to give up the rights that we gave up to the Patriot Act and so on. But, but there was a lot of fear and a lot of fear was cultivated by media so that people seem to feel automatically, I have to do this, I have to go in this direction. So, you know, I wonder if we're at a moment still where we're going to 
enter into um, something, you know, that will not allow people to question or open to the, in, at least in an immediate way, to the kind of investigation that would allow them to, um, exp you know, expand or change or transform. I mean, do you have a feeling for that or do you just don't, yes. you know, you don't know? I, I, I think, I don't think that there's a direct path uh, to mm -hmm. where we're going. It's a very indirect path that is actually going to require many, many initiations. And at best, we can only know the next step of the path, but we can't see it. There's no map. Mm -hmm. And as far as civil strife, civil war, um, I think that the body politic, our collective body, will go through a mighty struggle, analogous to the intense internal struggle that someone mm -hmm. might go through when they're in um, going through a life initiation, mm -hmm. uh, going through a deep illness, going through a, a, the collapse of a marriage, uh, with when you have different voices contending within mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. uh, trying to establish meaning and trying to figure it out, what's happening to me? And then sometimes, maybe often, it's when that struggle is exhausted. Mm -hmm. Those contending voices give up mm -hmm. and and, and you give up the fight, to give up the fight to understand. Only then does understanding come. Because only mm -hmm. then have the already existing ways of seeing and ways of being been exhausted. Only then is there room for a new thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think very likely, yeah, we're gonna see mm -hmm. civil war mm -hmm. or, or, or something like that. Something like that a mighty internal struggle of the body politic. Right. And when those two sides get exhausted, then a magnificent peace can be born. Mm -hmm. And so what is our role in this? Maybe it's to uh, sow the seeds of that peace. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's mm -hmm. to seed the new story that we will not be ready for until the old has completely exhausted itself. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I mean, I, I think that there's there's room to begin to recognize like I'm, I'm for my own part, what I'm what I'm especially interested in is uh, uh, developing a whole new attitude towards death. And I don't mean the sort of Elizabeth Kubler Ross. I mean, that was great that that happened and so on. But it, it's it was not nearly enough. And uh, there's so much that that has been explored about death and the Tibetans, of course, are, are real scientists of death. And uh, then there's, there's also a lot of Western science, but we've been afraid to actually, for whatever reason, look deeply into the transformation of death. And of course it's the, um, I think if people could begin to see death as a transition and something that is deeply connected to them personally in a way that is very interesting and that we could form communities to help people die with confidence. Just the opposite of what happened during this COVID time when so many people, like 43% I saw at one point of the deaths in the US were people that were living in care centers, nursing homes or you know, residential centers where nobody was there to go through the process with them, not their families, not their friends. We weren't allowed to put on protective gear and to sign a consent form to go sit. I have a good friend right now who's in a care center and I have not been able to stand any, you know, I have to see her through a screen and a plexiglass and just kind of wave at her for an hour, you know. So the fact that we let so many people die during this time and that we don't understand death as an aspect of life, we don't understand the transformation, the transition of consciousness through it. I, I feel like that's something that's coming. You know, that that's just on the horizon and that it, it, it's a very big part of the anxiety that people feel right now, because if they, if they felt, let's say, more comfortable with death as a transitional process, um, this virus is mostly killing people who are old. It's mostly killing people that would die from something pretty yeah. soon anyway. The median and age of death is like 79 or something like that or I 80. Know. Yeah. 
I yeah. know. And that's the normal human lifespan is 80, give or take five years. So those, those people would be dying of something. You know, it just wouldn't be this virus. So it's not as though the virus is actually creating a terrible catastrophe for people at all ages. You know, there are some people die at other ages, but by and large, it's this one age group. And that's the age group that would be dying anyway. And that we've taken in many, in many cases, people take these extreme measures at the end of their natural lifespan you know, to extend their lives by maybe two months and make themselves totally miserable. And, and, and you know, it's just, it's not a way to die. And uh, so it seems to me that that's one of the horizons that is, is opening and coming into view. And another one, as you mentioned, is, is gardening and local communities, you know, that are forming and have been forming even, you know, before this confinement. Um, but it it is it's it's difficult for me to envision how destructive uh, some sort of civil strife or civil war could be uh, in in America at this time. I mean, it's it's uh, I I was I've really really hoped through this long time of polarization, I've hoped that we could avoid another civil war because we've already done that once, you know, and it was a total disaster. Uh, but it, I, I agree with you. I don't think we're going to find this transformation without some kind of struggle. Uh, I don't think it's, I, unless, you know, unless something happens that I, that I can't see at all, you know, which I suppose is possible because I have no crystal ball. I mean, I just, yeah. uh, you know, I just kind of look around and try to understand what's going on. Um, but I, I think there, there is a way that humanity and human beings um, may be at the edge of what you were describing as, um, you know, their, their immature dependence. And just seeing the horizon of what mature dependence would look like, and of course it would involve a different relationship to the planet, but by and large, it would also require a different relationship to each other, like just really the end of killing each other for having different opinions. You know, it's like human beings don't kill each other uh, because of resources. We kill each other because of our opinions, you know, because somebody believes this or they see things this way and that doesn't agree with me. And um, so, you know, that's, that's something that I feel... Uh, really we have to learn to stop doing. And uh, it's, it, it requires a lot of, of restraint and constraint. Um, but I think it's possible. <laughs> Without solving polarization, if that doesn't change, then no problem can be solved. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Nothing else can be solved. It has to be solved first. And people have to see that the kind of being that we are includes language. And as Mary Oliver says, you know, the role of human beings seems to be that we stand around and wring our hands and say, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know, we're not silent like a rock. We don't flow like the water. We do this one thing with language, but it is also, you know, it's, it's the way that we could learn not to kill each other, talk to each other instead. But on the other hand, we make up these narratives that, that turn us against each other. So it's, it's like our ability to speak and to speak abstractly, to speak of things that are not happening in the room is this tremendous gift and this tremendous difficulty. You know, it sort of has these, these qualities that make it extremely interesting. And, and again, I, I feel like we're the only animal on earth that can stop you know, mid action and say, wait a minute, I don't want to do that because that would actually harm somebody or can apologize, you know? And so we, we have these capacities that uh, could help us a lot if we use them, you know, in regard to getting polarized. Uh, so in that way, you know, I mean, I, I feel like your vision is a hopeful vision 
and I've, I've been feeling much more bleak about things. But I mean, even in talking with you, I feel a little less bleak because I think that uh, you're sort of from your corner of the world, uh, you see what's sort of what's possible in the development of a, of a, let's say, a hopeful way of being. And uh, somewhat from my corner of the world as a therapist, what I have seen is this, this consuming preoccupation with control. And, I, you know, I've seen it so much. Uh, and, you know, it, in a way where I, where I live here, uh, my, my, uh, I make the joke that the people I treat in therapy are neurotic Buddhists, you know, because everybody's kind of a Buddhist. I live in sort of a Buddhist ghetto. <laughs> everybody claims to be a Buddhist or practice mindfulness, even, you know, even if they don't, I don't know, but um, I can see the, I can see the limits of that approach because it, it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, counteract the desire for control. And yeah. That's one reason I decided not to become a Buddhist. You know, I was like, <laughs> I'm not really sure if it's doing much good. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. I tell you, I've been in that I've been in the Buddhist world for a very long time now, and I've been in many communities and seen a lot of people, mostly North American Buddhists, although some in Japan too. But um, yeah, there's a, there's, there are some problems within Buddhism. The, I think the, uh, there are a couple of areas where Buddhism is extraordinary. One is the vision of dependent arising or how things emerge from contingencies and they're not predetermined. And the other area is in regard to rebirth and how it oh, works. I mean, I think there's a lot of, of, of you know, really important insights. Like, I, I'm not dismissing the religion no, but, at all. But, but there are a but lot I wanna, of problems. Actually, I want to touch on something you just said. Um, uh, you know, talking about your, your psychotherapy clients, you know, and this thing about control. And I'm curious, what are the circumstances in which they really truly let go of control to a significant degree? Like, what has to happen? Uh, one is when they're dying. That's yeah. amazing. When somebody's actually dying, it's amazing yeah. what they can accomplish as long as they stay conscious. And I've gone through that process with some people. Uh, another is, um, I guess, how would I say this? So earlier when you were mentioning the birth process, so the, my first baby weighed 10 pounds, one and a half ounces. That's my daughter who's uh, very tall <laughs> now. And um, going through that birth process, I had to surrender control completely because uh, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't wanna take any kind of uh, drug or anything. And, um, and uh, the, I was in North Carolina in a rural area. The doctor didn't know what was happening. <laughs> you know, basically I had this huge baby. It was a long childbirth. I didn't know if I was dying or if I was getting birth, giving birth. At times I thought I was dying and other times I thought I was the baby. I mean, it was just so confusing. I've only taken LSD once in my life. It was, it was not a pleasant experience, um, but it was like giving birth. It was kind of like I had to surrender control completely. And it was, I had a pretty psychotic experience. I have a kind of, I would say my core personality has a lot of, psychosis in it you know i'm not very neurotic i'm more like the other side um and but it, it was it was similar to childbirth like you know i knew that once i took that lsd i was going through i could not get out i was going to have to go through and i think when people experience something like that where they have to surrender control because they're going through something and there's no way that they can control it they're in a process they're still conscious but they're in a process that is taking them, then I think they, they you know, some people freak out and they, they then actually make things worse, but some people can surrender control. So, um, you know, in therapy, I find that uh, sometimes, so I do a lot of couples therapy, and sometimes when people really see that losing their relationship is going to be more painful than staying, uh, they can begin to surrender control. Uh, so, you know, it's often in these moments where something is overtaking the ego. You know? Yeah. 
The reason I asked is because I want to apply it to the collective. You know, what's it going to take for us to collectively release control to a significant degree? And it's not like control is bad or, or, or that no, we shouldn't no, do anything to preserve sometimes. the separate yeah. self, you know, or right. to stay alive. Right. It's just, um, what is it in service to? And what's the most important thing? And it's kind of taken on a life of its own. Right, where, right. Right. And I think it's been in service to survival. I mean, I do think it's like a grasping on to survival, you know, it's in, but any fantasy of survival, whether it's your kid or, you know, your own health or whatever, it's usually a fantasy of survival rather than real survival, because in real survival, you actually do need flexibility. You need, you need to surrender. You need to give in. You need to recognize modestly that you don't know what's going on, right. you know, uh, but it, in that, fantasy that you can grasp onto something and make it be the way you want it to be. I, I do think that it's a lot about survival. And, um, it, you know, in again, in this fantasy of survival. So I guess I think that I don't know. I mean, I don't know with the uh, whole COVID thing. I feel like the challenge is to really see what this virus is and isn't, you know, and not to be so afraid of something that really is about the, you know, it's, it's, it's really about the end of, it's about the end of the lifespan mostly, you know, and there is a lifespan <laughs> and, and, you know, it does have an end. And, you know, it's kind of like we all signed the contract when we came in here that this thing was going to end and if we could just find that to be interesting and engaging rather than terrible and diminishing, you know, I, something, I don't know, but I, I, I think the disease itself has a character that is kind of interesting, you know, um, and, uh, and yet from the very beginning, I said, you know, I'm not so afraid of the disease, but I'm afraid of what people are going to do about this and uh that's where i've continued to be concerned i i think that um you know like you say in your essay and i have certainly felt it that that whole range of what we called normal was getting more and more extreme it had to crack it had to break and this is breaking it but uh not in the way let's say i would have hoped <laughs> I, I, w I would have hoped for something where people were being um, less controlling, you know. To a large degree, it's not breaking normal, it's intensifying normal. It's intensifying normal, you're right, you're right. And, but to, to walk around and see all these people in masks and to realize, you know, it's very hard to read a face with a mask on it. It's very hard for children to tell whether someone is angry or happy or anything with a mask on. Um, that is bizarre. The whole thing, like when I when yeah. I think about it, I realize how bizarre it is. And, but it's interesting to me that that before COVID, people were more and more masked. Before COVID, because so much communication is online, it's harder and harder to tell if yeah. you know what somebody's really feeling. That's right. Before COVID, right. more and more of life was moving online. Before yeah. COVID, the the consciousness of safety and control was rising. Before COVID, the tendencies toward the totalitarian police state were intensifying. So, like right. nothing is new here. Right. Really. Right. But people were more and more afraid of each other. Like yeah, they're, more and yeah. more distanced. Social distancing was already happening. Public was. space was already becoming, you know, more and more contained. Like right. less and less of life was happening in public. More and more was right. happening in private. Like. Right. More and more distance education. I mean, really, everything that we're seeing now is a continuation of longstanding mm -hmm. trends. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's not, yeah, it's not a reset. It's like an extreme, yes, it's extreme yeah. exaggeration of it. I'm, you know, and in, the, in a sense, the masks. So I've done a number of, of uh, talks about the archetype of contagion and about the meaning of masks. And masks have always meant disguise. And they've been used at Carnival. They've been used by the Ku Klux Klan. They've been used in the burqa. I mean, anytime you want to disguise, and usually you're disguising for nefarious purposes, 
you're not generally disguising for good reasons. And, um, and now, you know, lots of people wearing masks creates anxiety about other people also. And, you know, I'm, I think for children especially, they, they don't understand what's going on and they have to see people masks all the, masked all the time. I know my five-year-old grandson is afraid of going outside because he's afraid that that's where the germs are, you know, because he's heard so much about staying in. And uh, of course he doesn't understand what a germ is, you know. Um, yeah. It's just that uh, the story is you're safer inside. And that- I mean, that's, and again, the childhood has been migrating inside for my whole <laughs> lifetime. Right, right, yeah. that's true, that's true. But, but not, not this extreme, I mean, it's true, you know, and at the same time, there's something sort of bizarre or let's say even um, <coughs> sort of monstrous about wearing masks all the time and being around a lot of masked people, you know? It's like, I, I wonder if people will, will feel that and react to it just, and I know all over Europe, there are a lot more protests about the wearing of masks and so on than there have been in America, but, I, I sometimes have fantasies when I'm out that everybody's just going to rip their mask off and dance or something, you know, and stop this because also there's just, there's just no infection around here. But if I say that, people say, but you could be asymptomatic. <laughs> I say, no, not really, because you have to be in touch with somebody who's infected in order to be asymptomatic. But, you know, so that, that sense of removal, it's extreme now, and maybe it will push our buttons, you know, to the degree that we, we just can't stand it anymore to be so isolated from each other. Um, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, I, I think that one thing that I have liked, and I'm liking talking to you this way, I have liked being able to talk to people. I've been talking in these interviews with people that I've always wanted to talk to, but would not have met up with otherwise because I'd be too busy flying around in my niche and talking to the people that, you know, kind of want to talk to me. And now I've got to talk to people that I've gotten to talk to people I want to talk to. You know? Yeah. And that's, that's been, that's been really nice. Um, so I'm going to land this plane where we're, 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 we're ending here. And I think this is an interesting point to end. I wonder if you want to add anything about uh, just sort of what you see from, you know, your, your perch about what you think is coming next or what you imagine will come in, a, you know, as a result of the elections or... Uh, whether it's the election or something else, I think we're going to have some kind of event that will uh, be an even harder strike on our collective identity yeah. and our uh, sense-making of the world. Um, and, and that this barrage will continue until yeah. the world cracks. So I agree with you. I actually yeah. agree with you. I'm glad you said it before. I said it <laughs> mm -hmm. because I, I, I think your intuition is correct. I really It could be something so far beyond what anybody is expecting that, yeah. that, you know, it could just be like this, almost like this gift uh, that comes often at the moment of maximum despair. That would be lovely. And, you know, I, I want to mention Lewis Hyde and gift because mm. you mentioned gift a lot. And I assume you've been influenced by, by Lewis Hyde, and um, I, I love the idea of gift, and I think also people often misunderstand it and don't know how to receive it, and you know see it more like I often think that people think that gifts should be like ordering from a catalog, you know it should be what you want instead of what you get, <laughs> and uh, I can imagine that, that the gift coming for all of us, you know, might not be exactly what we want, but it could be a gift uh, that we get. 
the best gifts are something that's beyond what we even know to ask for. Right. And I right. do think that something like that is coming. Well, thank you so much. That's a great place to end. And thank you for being here with me and offering your ideas uh, so generously. Uh, and I look forward to talking with you some more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you, Charles. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.